All right, guys, you're tuned in to another episode of the Talk and Shed podcast. Cody and I, Cody, been a minute. it's been a while, and I'm sorry, guys, we have dropped the ball. Don't have any excuse. Uh, we've all been busy, but here we are, getting an episode rolled out to you. Yep. But uh, today... Let's, yeah, let's talk about where we're at. Yeah, today, we are far from home. We are in uh, Madison, Wisconsin mm-hmm. today. Uh, we came up here for the Dealer Minds Summit. It's a summit put on by uh, Lesseter Media where a bunch of dealers get together and we talk about ways to become more efficient, ways to improve. Um, this one's kind of uh, focused on succession planning, Um Succession planning, basically, um, basically management inside the company. Yeah, how you're planning on successing the next guy in line. Yeah. So whether it's a, uh, you know, a, a shop manager or a sales manager, or whatever that is. Yeah. A so lot, a lot of good stuff. Yeah. It's a two day event. We got in here yesterday, and. Uh, late yesterday yeah yeah we'll mm-hmm. head head home tomorrow but uh it's an event that i've been attending now for i don't know five or six years mm-hmm. and uh really enjoy it meet a lot of good other dealers we met a guy tonight from uh glass cock equipment mm-hmm. what was his name uh scott yeah real good guy he's the mm-hmm. general manager over there um so we we get to meet a lot of dealers some of them have got you know 20 plus stores yeah tonight they gave uh h&r agripower the dealership of the year Mm -hmm. award they have 700 employees and sell i wrote it down 300 and some million something like that and they're spread across like seven different states down in the south unbelievable from like kentucky indiana missouri yeah Tennessee. Yeah. They're all over the place. Yeah, the Hunt family. Mm-hmm. Pretty cool. So, you know, you learn a lot from dealerships like that. You know, you'll we'll talk we talked to some CEOs of uh of like Johnson Tractor. Mm-hmm. Um I talked to the president of Huber today. Just yep. you learn a lot from them guys. You know, they're doing stuff on some pretty efficient levels. Yeah. And uh Yep, I had the opportunity to talk to a guy from uh, Titan Machinery. He was a regional sales man- manager out in uh, Idaho is where he was from. So they do a lot of sugar beets, um, a lot of uh, malt barley for uh, Anheuser-Busch and Coors. They've got some plants out there that they contract. So uh, sugar beets, malt barley, a lot of that smaller specialty crop, and, of course, potatoes being from Idaho. So. Yeah, pretty cool stuff. <clears throat> a really cool event. Uh, it was about a six and a half hour drive up here and went through Chicago and up through the northern part of Illinois and up into uh, mm-hmm. Wisconsin. So, good trip. We'll be back home tomorrow and back at it. Yeah. So, it's. Yeah, uh, we, we drove by. I meant to tell you this on our way here, but um, we went through Rockford, Illinois. Yeah. And I've got a wide drop toolbar in that area. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of his name. I can't think of it at the moment, but it'll come to me. Yeah, but, so uh, today's August 6th. Um, so a lot of stuff going on. You know, we um, this time of year, there's a lot of county fairs, a lot of state fairs going on. Mm-hmm. Our, our county fair starts this week. Mm-hmm. I think Thursday. Yep. But... Uh, yeah it's been it's been good you know we've been getting a lot of rain back home uh grass is green crops are green and really our whole way up here everything was green yeah i mean yeah uh, everything looked pretty dang good uniform tall deep green Mm -hmm. nothing's even thinking about firing up from the bottom no it's uh there was stuff. There was some stuff at home that was just thinking about it, just on the outsides. But you get into those fields, and they're they look pretty good. Yeah, we got a tick dry 
for a little bit there through the the tail end of july mm-hmm. and i mean i say dry we were far from <laughs> what some people are experiencing yeah. but it was the driest we had been this season yeah but corn looks good the beans early on up until about july 15th looked pretty bad yeah they were just kind of stuck um but man they've taken off since the end of july everything's canopied everything Mm -hmm. looks really good we were Um, we were talking about it yesterday it it, it's almost like with one of those deals with beans especially later season beans like that to where there's like a a month time frame to where you almost can't even look at them before you even know what you got out there mm-hmm. type deal you know um you know with us being really wet early on this spring i think that had a lot of a toll to take on them and they were planted late yeah yeah and they just had to get out of that that funk stage that they were in yeah so yeah they look good now um you know the wheat came off super early we cut mine, I think, June 25th or something like that. And yep. we got double crop beans chased right back in there behind it. And <clears throat> we were out in those double crops yesterday. And holy cow, those things look good. Yeah, they're, what, maybe knee high yet? Yeah. Yeah, Close they're, to they're, that. they're flowering. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, they're going to go in there and spray them for the first time, get those weeds and volunteer wheat knocked down. And We did them a little goofy this year. Yeah, we did twin row 30s, mm-hmm. seven and a half inch spacing every 30 inches. Um, I like it. Uh, when yeah. we were doing it, you know, last year we crossed those beans. We went north and south with 100,000 seeds, and then we went east and west with 100,000 seeds. So it was in a checkerboard pattern. I really like that because you get that earlier canopy. Um, but of course, it takes you twice as long to plant it. Mm hmm course we're not doing a lot of acres but still takes forever this year we just hooked up the splitter to the planter and uh did it all in one shot so i I really am very happy with how they look today yeah i got my four hours behind the (laughs) behind the planter this year so yeah but yeah you were in front of the planter but well yeah um, i was in front of it but yeah but it was good yeah so double crop beans it was dry at that time Mm -hmm. you know when we planted them yep soil Uh, conditions were right whenever we planted them uh had the row cleaners going getting that residue out of the road and getting that stuff planted and show good emergence to start and they're off to the races yeah they took off last year my double crops did about 30 and with the earlier planting i planted about two weeks sooner i'm hoping we can jump up into that 40 bushel mark on them doubles yeah just as long as we keep getting some rains yep i think we'll be okay so i think uh i haven't heard from anything around home i know there was some stuff north of us that there were some spots that got around an inch but uh we're thinking around home we got somewhere around a half so yeah today Mm mm-hmm yep so yeah, overall, I it's it's not news to anyone that uh, the crops look pretty good. Yeah. Um, so there will definitely be some bushels out there to harvest. Mm-hmm. I'll be really curious to see what the corn does around us. You know, we had some really good yields the last couple of years. I talked to a lot of guys who said they've never harvested corn that yielded that good. Um, we might touch and play with that top end again this year yeah there's definitely some potential out there everything's almost done with pollination and everything else and yeah we had good weather it was mm -hmm. nice and cool during that time not a lot of stress on it that's for sure yeah now of course everyone's been flying the planes and putting on the fungicide i know some guys had tar spot i've got white mold in my beans so i don't know how that's going to play out um if anyone listening has a lot of experience with white mold maybe you can help me out yeah yeah um from what i'm told there's really not much you can do about it mm -hmm. um i'm hoping it's fairly concentrated of course i didn't walk the whole field um and i did 30 inch beans on my full seasons so i'm thinking that where i found it it was just kind of concentrated to that area because those beans in that one spot got super tall yeah. like 
almost shoulder high. They're they're kind of married up right next to the tree line too, so it doesn't always get all the sun possible. So yeah, trying to see. We'll we'll have to get back out there and see. Yeah, if we can find it in other parts of the field. Yeah, we'll have to do a little more scouting. But yeah, I I did a lot of calling around and talking to guys, and they said, you know, overall there's not much you can do there's not really a fungicide that can really deter it um endura is a fungicide you can do it's extremely expensive it's 40 dollars an acre before application um and it really doesn't even control it that well so i wasn't going to do that um i know you can actually put a uh, hydrogen peroxide on it um that would be kind of interesting, but I don't know. We'll see. I'm going to let it go for now and I guess see what the heck happens. Hopefully it's kind of minimal. Yeah, that's all we but can do. Is I, I talked so. to a lot of farmers last year that had it, and it was very devastating. You know, in areas where it was concentrated, it knocked off 20 to 30 bushels pretty easy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, so that's uh, that's what's going on today. Now. Mm-hmm talk a little bit about our field day cody for for those of you guys that don't follow along or maybe you do we had a field day there a few weeks back yeah potentially even maybe some of you listeners were even there um so yeah we we had a field day here about three weeks ago uh ran some strip till stuff ran some salford tools uh big shout out to everybody that was able to attend and uh all of our uh, all of our uh manufacturers that were there as well representatives of the manufacturers that we represent um huge shout out to them as well we had a little bit of a uh, a basically a manufacturer appreciation meal at uh, your mom and dad's uh on tuesday yep and uh we had the deutz guys there some representatives basically from everybody who we sell for and uh it was it was a very good turnout. We had some fun and it was phenomenal. Mm-hmm. I was uh, I was blown away. You know, going into it, I was pretty confident we were going to have a good crowd. Of course, you never know. You know, doing a field day, all it would take was a good rain event to shut the whole thing down. And uh, I knew we were going to have a good crowd. I had a lot of guys telling me they were going to come. And uh, we try to keep it different a little bit every year or demo more stuff or different stuff. And I think what really gets the crowd in there is just the amount of real life demos that we run. Um, You know, we ran Salford 5200s. We ran Salfords with shanks and some strip till units. It's just there's so much to see in one short time i mean we don't waste a whole lot of time doing it we're only out in the field for less than two hours Mm -hmm. uh we run the tool we talk about it we dig and uh try to keep it extremely informative we just want to show all the equipment out there working so that you guys can make a decision on hey that could work on my farm or no it won't work on my farm and whatever you think will work on your farm we want to then dive deeper into that with you maybe do an on-farm demo at your place so Mm -hmm. yeah i was extremely excited we had i don't even remember there's probably 200 people there yeah and uh yeah then Mm -hmm. we brought them back and fed fed everyone lunch in the shop and had the ice cream machine rolling oh it was a great day Mm -hmm. it was so fun i I love being able to do those demos it's in it's during a time of year when there's not a whole lot going on and uh yeah we hit that one right now Mm -hmm. i talk rain event literally when we were finishing up our last demo it started to rain and we ended up getting rain as soon as soon as it was over so that couldn't have worked out any better but i'm i'm extremely happy with how it went it dumped it down yeah (laughs) it did it dumped it down um no we yeah we were like adam touched on we we demoed quite a few salford tools we demoed a 2200 with and without shanks running uh we demoed uh, a 5200 and of course a uh, halo vrt 
Um, but I think the most impressive tool of that day was the uh, field cultivator. No doubt. I mean, when you whip out a field cultivator into untouched wheat stubble, people really start to scratch their heads. But uh, <clears throat> we've done it before, and I had confidence in it. That thing will dig. We we honestly we honestly talked about it there on Tuesday night. It was probably about nine o'clock. We were talking about it, and we were like, "Should we hook it up? Should we hook it up?" And we we didn't really have a decision made at that time. And I came to Adam about seven thirty that morning. I was like, "You know what? We've got one sitting there. It's assembled. Let's just run it." Yep. So we we ran that and. That thing was very impressive. It was a two piece S time what we ran um, with a two bar coal ton harrow and a double 11 inch rolling basket, and it worked very, very well. Yeah, it was awesome. So, shout out to everyone that came. Uh, we're going to continue to do the field days, we're going to continue to do customer events in general. Mm -hmm. You know, just like I said, <clears throat> it's hard to beat just getting customers there to the field and getting getting dirty figuring out you know what tools could work for them and what won't and uh so yeah field day was great and i think we're, we're kicking around having another event after ohio farm science review which would land us into that late september range I want to do a field day event that just focuses strictly on strip till. Mm -hmm. You know, we ran some strip till units at the field day, but I want to have a strip till only field day. Yep. Where we go in there, we make multiple passes of strip till. We do some serious digging uh, with several different units, you know, Yetter, Aguru, Dawn. And do a lot of different configurations, run the strip fresheners, run the Mavericks, go deep with mole knives, and and then take it a step further and band fertilizer mm -hmm. while we're doing it too and talk about the efficiencies that can come with the strip till and, uh, <clears throat> and all that stuff. You know, there's a lot of push going in that direction, and uh, we've always kind of been known for strip till, and we want to we wanna help uh, – we want to own that market for one – but we want to help guys who are kicking around strip till because it's a big jump. Yeah, not only a big jump, just a big topic in general. You know, just you know what is going to be the right unit for you. How is that going to help you perform in your operation, and is it going to make you more efficient on your fertilizer placement? And not even only fertilizer placement, but also your your tillage passes as well. You know, it's kind of a way to well maybe we can make all this stuff in the fall or maybe we're doing it all in the spring ahead of the planner you know that the options are endless as far as what we can do and what we you know what will fit your operation as far as that build yeah and that's what's the the beauty of some of the units today is you can run them in the fall or the spring and mm -hmm. that's a big deal yeah. you got to be able to you know if you're going to invest that money you got to have a unit that's versatile enough to run in almost any condition, you know, corn on corn, or maybe you want to strip your beans. Mm -hmm. There's some guys doing that. Yep. Go into heavy corn residue or go into that bean stubble or do it in the spring and be able to finish it off smooth enough to where you can plan into it. Um, so that's what we're thinking. We want to, obviously <clears throat> it'll be uh a little bit smaller event than our main field day but just get in there and spend some serious time with those guys who are on the fence about strip till and help them make that decision if if it's a good strategy and and a good move uh for them so mm -hmm. we'll see which starting tomorrow after this dealer summit is the national strip till conference yes and uh, we're not going to be able to stick around for that i wish we could but uh yeah that'll i'm sure there'll be a ton of farmers in here uh wanting to learn more about strip till at that event too yep absolutely so, absolutely so so let's talk a little bit about what we've been up to um believe it or not it's been a super busy july busy summer in general for yeah. us um we had a huge july 
for uh, Salford Tillage. We had a lot of successes to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, there's really, there's not really just one tool that was on fire. I mean, the 5200 and the VRT, as always, they were on fire. But uh, we we've done a great job of of uh, being able to market and sell that 5200. Yeah. You know, we were just talking today how with all this residue that we are, that we have had in the fall from these yields and that we're going to continue to get as we're pushing this corn. You know, last year that corn was still green at harvest. Everyone remembers how wet that corn was coming off <clears throat> and it becomes really hard to manage. And we're finding that that 5200 is kind of that secret. Um, it manages residue. It leaves it super level, super finished. And uh, we've been trading in some chisels on that thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it's kind of like the concept of, uh, you know, the, the 875s were very, very popular. Well, with what guys were finding out down later on whenever it came to springtime is that those 875s were sometimes ripping the bottoms out to where we weren't having necessarily a good enough a good enough uh winter to where it would weather it down enough to where they wouldn't have that sinking deal so that's where kind of the 5200 comes into that role play to where you know we're basically just taking the six the the top six inches of that soil and that residue and just burying it and incorporating it and trying to manage that residue as best as we can so that way we can get in there early enough you know in that late april early may time frame and get those beans planted whenever they need to be planted yeah it's uh <clears throat> it's salford's most popular tool across the company yeah which you know is pretty impressive mm -hmm whenever you stack it up against that 2200 or the vrt mm -hmm. um it's it's been good and so um we've been building a lot of salford tools um this week we had a or this past week we had a Hagee sprayer in the shop mm -hmm. we were putting a uh fe one of our fe4r cover crop cedars on that unit mm -hmm. Today, we just shipped a FE4R cover crop cedar to New York. It's getting uh, mounted on an Oxbow sprayer. And then as soon as we get back, we're going to go measure up a Miller sprayer to put yeah. another FE4R on. Yeah. So, yeah, those those have really taken off here. Just, I mean, we've sold them for a while, but here this year, we we gained a lot of interest here in the last two months yeah on them. i mean cover crops have always been big for us and we uh we're starting to piece together a trip to illinois and missouri where we will be mounting some valmar cover crop cedars on uh going to do a teramax 25 foot teramax in missouri mm -hmm. and we're going to be doing a case 25 foot 330 mm -hmm. in illinois Yep, and uh, there's one more tool that I'm going to try and get teed up into that trip. So hopefully it's a three seater trip. We'll load up the trailer. <clears throat> we'll have uh, a couple guys go out and we'll do that install. So that's that's always something big that we do is we go out and install these seaters, and mm -hmm. that that stuff is still very alive and well. Um, so that's been uh, taking up a lot of our time here this summer. Is this, these cover crop projects, uh, putting together Salford tools. Um, we're working on piecing together a <coughs> semi trailer, a tender trailer. Yep. You guys have probably seen all the videos of those that we've done, you know, equipping them with a Surefire or SurePoint uh, quick draw system with mm -hmm. some <coughs> Enduroplast tanks. Those are just the handiest dang things to have around yeah. when you're spraying and stuff. Um, they can auto, you know, do all your auto batching, mixing of all your chemicals. Um, so, yeah, there's there's been a lot going on. Then, of course, you know, we've been selling some of our used stuff as well. We always have used equipment to sell. We, we sold uh, a 34-foot <clears throat> Case 335 lately. Mm -hmm. uh, we sold a some, some used Salford equipment. Yep. Um, 
Mm-hmm. Sold some rolling baskets here recently. Yep. Um, some used liquid applicators. So things are still rolling, um, but we're definitely going to have to uh, get a little bit bit more unique and, and back to the basics as far as uh, hunting customers down and really helping them uh, with their needs here in the future. Mm-hmm. But overall, we've been busy. Uh, the other thing, talking about cover crops that we need to touch on, is that cornhead cedar. Yep. Why don't you talk a little bit about that cornhead cedar? Yeah, so uh, basically the cornhead cedar, uh, that's a product that we developed um, so basically, like Adam said, it's corn head cedar. So the cedar itself actually mounts onto the uh, corn head itself, and we are able to apply that cover crop underneath the snoots of the uh, corn header. And basically, the residue covers it on top, kind of like if you were seeding your. Um, like if you were seeding your yard and you're wanting to put straw on top of it, you know, that residue gets on top of that cover crop seed and helps hold that moisture for it to help it ge- uh, germinate. You, you said snoots. <clears throat> There's always a lot of conversation online about if that's the correct terminology. Snoots, snouts, snoses, noses. That's what I've always called them. I know, me too. I, I, yeah, I... Me I, too. Yeah, I, I guess I can't. I can't say whether which term is snout. correct or not. Or yeah, I, I mean, it's funny though. There, there will be some people say, "What the heck is a snoot?" The plastic things that go in between the cornrows <laughs> sticks out front. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I so. know. I, I always hear. Well, I'm. It's just like. Uh, it's just like uh, grain carts. Mm-hmm. You go to some parts of the world and they're a grain cart. Other mm-hmm. places they're a buggy. Mm-hmm. Other places they're a, a, a grain tank. Yeah, <laughs> but it, I just had to say that because I know there will be people saying, "What's a snoot?" Mm-hmm. But that's what I've always called them. Yeah, but yeah, we we run the hose <clears throat> up under there, and the goal there is is uh, we put this seed on bare dirt right in between the corn rows, basically before the corn it even gets into the snapping rolls. We're putting that seed down, and so the snapping rolls will lay down a, a little bit of fodder, the seeds down, and then when the combine rolls through, all that fodder gets kicked out the back, and like Cody said, it lays on top of that mm-hmm. seed. And the beauty there is, you know, when you're done harvesting, you're also done seeding your cover crops. Yeah. So mm-hmm. no additional passes. Now, sure, you're going to have to stop from time to time to fill up the hopper, but it's pretty minimal compared to having to make a complete additional pass. Right. Um, germination rates are extremely high because of that residue mat that's on top of the seed. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm telling you, there's not a more efficient way to put down your cover crops yeah. in the fall than, than with the combine. And, and it's not limited to what what head you have either you know we can make them fit you know whatever head you've got out there uh whether it's a case a deer a Gehringhoff, a drago you know we've we've done quite a few of them now to where we've got basically kind of a one not necessarily a one fits all but at least a a good scheme of how one would go on there yep um the original box would cover a six or an eight row and uh, right now, we're, uh, I've got a gentleman that's wanting to put one on a 12-row head. So we're in the midst of trying to get that one built and ready to go for him. Um, he's planning on starting harvest here in the middle of September. So we've got some boogieing to do on that. But uh, we'll get it done and uh, make sure it works, and she'll be ready to rock and roll. Yeah, that's a product that we've been playing with for, shoot, five or six years, Mm and we keep refining it and making it better and better. And I'm telling you, it's something that's going to keep taking off because of how efficient it is and uh, and, and the germination rates. You know, Mm -hmm. who wants to... Who wants to get through all your harvests and then have to go back through again with a light tillage pass just to seed your cover crops? I mean, that can definitely be done, Um, and we've done a lot of that with the Valmars, but man, if we can just hook it up to the combine 
it gets done mm-hmm. pretty well. So all of these are projects that have uh, <clears throat> that have been definitely keeping us busy, um, and have evolved. Oh yeah, <laughs> evolved I mean, constantly, means- trying to evolve these products and make them better and better. The the original the original philosophy of it was well we're just going to mount valmars on there well guys didn't like it because the visibility wasn't there well so we developed one and made it to where it's you know it sets underneath the head and you can see into the head and whatnot and uh now it's developed well can we get a bigger one so that way i can throw it on my 12 row head so just a lot of innovation as far as that aspect uh I know. I think the original one's still sitting down there at the farm. What you? I don't know if it's still sitting down there. We but s- we sold it to a customer. Did you? Yeah. 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 The whole <clears throat> this whole thing started a long time ago. My gosh, eight or ten years ago. And I said, man, we need to mount. We need to design a cedar that mounts onto a corn head. And we pieced one together. It was super small. It was just, it was really small. Mounted up to our six row. It was a ground drive unit, and uh, it worked. Mm-hmm. I mean, it flat worked, and I was like, holy cow. And through the winter, that field just got greener and greener, and uh, yeah, we've just built off of that. But you know, we talk about it a lot, but that's the type of stuff that really helps set us apart. Mm-hmm. You know, we can take these ideas, these farmer inter- innovations, and build on them and make them better and you know we've got the plasma we've got the solid work software we can draw on we've got capabilities to laser mm-hmm. and weld and powder coat and and create an end result product that's got some serious roi to it yeah um you know like when we come to to places like we're at today at these dealership mind summits we do have a lot of similarities to some of these dealers, whether they're one store or 27 stores. Mm -hmm. But one thing that's always kind of different is our ability to not only design and manufacture, but also do some different service work. You know, a a lot of these dealerships, they want to hook up a, uh, a computer into a tractor and it tells you that the def sensor is bad and you replace it and on you go and uh, john deere says that, that job should take three hours and you build a customer and away you go you know you send something like this into the one of their shops and there there's no way yeah um whereas we can we can refine some of this stuff you know maybe a guy wants to put a certain coulter on an applicator that usually isn't really designed for that Mm -hmm. but we can make brackets and offsets and welds and mounts to to make it all work the the adaptability that we have to make some of that stuff work i think is what really helps set us apart you know um i was at jeff dooling's uh field day here last week and uh you know he we've made some stuff for him and he's like you know you you guys just seem to have it figured out as far as you know a guy comes to you with an idea and you and th- there's a dang good chance that we've done it or done something like it and the guy might think that it's just the most harebrained idea ever but he's like oh well you guys have done that before and oh yeah yeah we've done it before uh we were talking about his inner cedar bar his s2s bar and he's like oh yeah he's like we he goes, I, I, I use that thing in uh, everyday application, whether I'm using it to freshen up, uh, freshen up strips that I've made in the fall or if I'm looking to apply cover crop in the fall or not only interseed with that unit as well. So Yeah, and it, it boils down <clears throat> to listening to what the customers want mm-hmm. you know, and not just selling out of a book. You know, the, the book's going to provide 80% of, of what they need, but there's always a little tweak. Well, he might say, well, does that fit on this planner? Because it doesn't say in the book that it does, and it's like, well, we can make it fit on that planner. Yeah. So it, it's listening to the customer, <clears throat> but it's also not taking no for an answer. Yeah. And, you know, the manufacturer might say, well, that won't work. Well, 
why won't it work? Well, we don't have brackets for that. Or it's like, okay, well, if that's the only holdup, we can make brackets. Mm -hmm. You know, we can draw them up, get them lasered out, welded up, and powder coated. You bolt the brackets on, and mm -hmm. away we go. That's, I mean, that's how we got most of the brackets built for putting a Valmar on a on a Great Plains or a Kraus or you know whatever oh, yeah. whatever tool you you you're thinking of. I mean, we can get one on there. Yetter knows it better than anyone, but we were the first ones to put a Devastator on a Drago GT Cornhead. Mm -hmm. And I say we, I mean Mitch and I. Mm -hmm. um, again, the book said it can't work. Right. And I had a guy with a Drago GT, and he said, Adam, I want a Devastator on this GT. And uh, we made it happen. Yep. And guess what? Today, you can put a Drago or a Devastator on Drago GT. Mm hmm. No problem. Yep. Comes from the factory that way now. It too. does now. Looks mm -hmm. an awful lot like our brackets, too. Yeah. Can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> Innovation. But, uh, you know, there's that that's what sets it apart that's what we have fun doing i love that challenge i i love like you said with jeff dueling he came to us <clears throat> and we sat down he's like adam this might be crazy i'm like well, it might be but it's going to be pretty sweet when it's done mm -hmm. and you know it <clears throat> it works well for him and and stuff like that just like the heggy that we had in the shop with that fe4r box i mean you know there's no other place you can go to to take a, a liquid sprayer and put a dry box on it and successfully blow cover crops 90 or 120 feet yeah um especially on a miller or an oxbow right um so those are the little niches that we hone in on and uh it's it's what drives a lot of our success you know we we listen to the customer <clears throat> see what they need and and find that product or products that uh that's going to help their operation move forward mm -hmm. yeah so yeah um you know with harvest season coming up you know we we touched there briefly on the on the cornhead cedar um you know obviously adam mentioned devastators there a little bit you know that's definitely something to consider if you guys don't have one highly recommend it um, you know, not not only to save your tires, but with that residue management, that is all part of our residue management plan for a guy. Oh, you I, know, that, that that is the base or the groundwork of our residue management plan for a guy uh, wanting to do some minimum till and then going in and planting soybeans right into that. Yeah, um, and Jeff Worley, <clears throat> our Yetta rep, he always says it the first step to your planter pass is with the combine mm -hmm. and what he means by that is the key words that i hone in on a lot and it's residue management mm -hmm. um we got to manage this residue so we start that with the combine you know get good stalk rolls on there get a calmer head kit on there get the 360 kit on there john deere makes an inner meshing uh, stalk roll we got to get that top three quarters of the plant chewed up into tiny one inch by one inch particles mm -hmm. when you do that you're still left with the bottom stalk mm -hmm. the strongest part of the stalk and that's where the devastator comes in it's going to roll in it's going to crack it open let it start to break down and uh, let microbes in there Mm -hmm. so the that is the first step if you're going to go into harvest this fall with all this residue and you're not running like a calmer kit or a 360 uh chain roll mm -hmm. and the devastators <clears throat> you're missing out right i mean how are you going to manage that residue you're setting you're just setting yourself back you are setting yourself back i mean you got to get that jump start on it mm -hmm. i mean if we could start breaking down the stalks today we would mm -hmm. i mean absolutely you know but we gotta of course wait for the combine and when that combine rolls through yeah we're, we're out there to harvest the crop we need mm -hmm. to get clean grain into the bins and into the elevator but while we're out there we might as well be start managing this residue right because the clock's ticking from the time you cut that stalk mm -hmm. to when that planter comes through you only have so many days yep 
and not o- not only do you lay it over and crimp it and help get those microbes in there, but in there, but you also get those stalks down closer to the ground, so that way those microbes can get into those corn stalks because you know the the bacteria that helps break those stalks down only works for a certain period of time you know november that stuff's basically gone so get yourself a jump start on that to where you can get it broke down and of course you know a a good hard winter will help with that as well but why not give it that jump start i mean as far as an roi standpoint that devastator is definitely up there in the top three on our list oh no doubt (coughs) and the what's what's awesome about that is you know we were talking about farmer innovation and and farmer feedback that devastator was designed uh by a farmer in indiana Mm -hmm. he he came up with the idea of that and uh passed it on to yetter and uh you know that's a product that that he just he thought of he's you know wanted a better way to save tires was Mm -hmm. the original goal but it does so much more than that today. But yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't want to <clears throat> make the podcast a sales pitch, but I'm telling you, we we work with customers day in and day out, and and the struggle and the conversation around managing residue gets more and more frequent. And I'm telling you, that residue, uh, if there was four inches of a mat last fall when you were harvesting. There's going to be four and three quarter this year. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. It's there. Yeah. The corn's tall. The leaves are healthy. It's there. And uh, <clears throat> we got to find ways to, to break it down because we don't want that to be an issue come spring. Because mm-hmm. that's so. just going to limit you on how soon you can get out there. Right. You know, especially, you know, you look at this spring, how wet we were, you know. <laughs> With being how wet we were, it, 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 it made it really tough for guys to get out there and get those beans planted when they needed to. No doubt. Because there was residue still on top of the ground sitting there, laying there, holding that moisture that prevented them getting in there. Yeah. I mean, we know with soybeans, plant date is, is number one. Mm-hmm. And if you can plant soybeans April 25th versus May 25th, they're going to out yield them all day long. Yep. I don't care what you throw at the May 25th beans, the April 25ths, you know, given equal circumstances, will always out yield them. So, got to get them out there. But yeah, so, but with the combine and with fall products, another a whole podcast topic that we could go on is I traveled out to Copperhead Ag mm-hmm. probably a month or so ago. They had an open house. Tim Gunkelman, who is Dave Gunkelman's son, Dave, as many of you guys know, is our Salford rep. And uh, Tim, he just got out of college, and uh, he works for Copperhead. He invited me out there to their open house, <clears throat> and I got to learn about that family-owned company and – what I'm getting at is their concaves. Yes. And I never knew until I got out there what concaves even did. Like, for the longest time, I thought, like, you buy a set of concaves from any name your company, and you're really just, I thought it was just like a wear part. Mm-hmm. But there's a science to it. Yeah. Like, he did a video with uh, Brian Brown running that new Fent in wheat. And he was telling me that they took out the Fent factory concaves, put in the copperheads, and they were able to gain like a mile an hour, slow down the rotor, gain fuel efficiency, and still get a cleaner sample and throw less mater- less seed out the back. Yeah. Like, think about that. That's a, that's a big deal. Mm-hmm. When you're combining... And you can save fuel, slow down the rotor, do all of those things by simply changing the concaves. Now, you're thinking, now, how is that possible? Well, standard concaves are are usually round versus the copperhead has got a 90-degree edge on there. And what that does is when that rotor's coming around, that 90-degree edge acts as like it, it goes against the grain, when that rotor's spinning to help thrash that grain easier 
out of the hull or the husk or the cob. And basically <clears throat> what it's doing is the rotor spins and, and it hits that 90 degree edge and it's peeling that seed out of that a lot easier. So rather than having to speed up your rotor to get that stuff flinging around to get it, it pulled out, you can actually slow down your rotor and it will pull it out quicker. And by slowing down your rotor, you can gain speed and lower your RPMs. That's where the fuel savings come from. But you also then get a cleaner sample. So there's a science to that. And I never really realized that until I went out there. And we've been selling concaves now. Yeah. Had good success with it. There's mm -hmm. guys that are really starting to, to realize that as well, that by simply changing to a concave that's actually not just designed to be round bar and welded and just kind of do a job. These are actually designed to do a much better job. So swap out the concaves and it's a big deal. Um, so I, I urge you to look at your concaves. Are they just the factory round bars? Watch some of the videos that we've done with the copperheads and going into fall for me, when I'm talking high ROI products to guys, I'm looking at the Devastator, of course, and everything that we just talked, but I'm honing in on concaves too mm -hmm. because it, it's going to make a big deal and a big difference in harvest, potentially higher speeds, definitely uh, slower rotor speeds, and less fuel consumption with a cleaner sample and less seed kicked out the back. Mm -hmm. They're a big deal. You sold one today. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um heading to michigan going in that series combine 680 um he uh he bought an applicator off me i don't know probably a year ago and uh he uh called me up today he's seen our email blast and was like hey um he goes i wasn't sure if you guys sold these or not but do you sell concaves for combines and i go yeah we do he goes well who do you who what you know what brand do you sell and i go well copperhead he never heard of it sent him a link to it and he goes oh okay and it's it's fairly simple to install i mean it's a nine page install manual and tells you how to install them i mean it comes in three pieces it's light it's not like the factory john deere's where i mean you try picking one of those things up it is not light Right. I mean, that thing comes in one piece, and you about need three guys to handle it and muscle it in there to get it in there. But uh, it'll come with some cover plates for wheat and whatnot. But, uh, no, it's a it's a product that I think will sell quite a few of them. I just, agree. Just because of just helping with that efficiency. And that's what everybody's trying to gain anyway is efficiency. So, you know, that's a, that's a big topic that everyone talks about. And, um, you know, that's that's why we you know why we kind of believed in them to where we would be able to help you guys get more efficiency out of your not only your combine but your operation no doubt so no doubt mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we've got our, our next uh farm show is farm science yep. ohio mm -hmm. mid-september what are we demoing there we are going to be demoing some some sow tillage tools mm -hmm. We're going to run that 5200 Enforcer. <clears throat> Last year, we pulled out of those demos. We said, you know what? It takes a lot of time. takes a lot of manpower. But uh, this year, we're diving back into it, and I'm kind of excited. You know, that is a demo-heavy show. A lot of people go there for the field demos, and I'm excited. You know, that 5200 has got a lot of steam behind it. Um I want to show guys what it can do with residue. I want to show guys how smooth it can run. We're also going to demo a Salford 2200 with hydraulic shanks. And it's the shanks that I'm really trying to hone in on. Uh, when you take a vertical tillage tool and add shanks to it, it is unbelievable what Different that tool ball does. Game. Different ball game. It's crazy. Um, and, and that's the beauty. You don't have to run those shanks all the time. You can just put them down in high traffic zones, or if you have a field that you're like, you know what, water laid on this thing. Uh, I got some wet holes here. I just want to drop the shanks in those. <clears throat> you can do that. Um, so 
I want to hone in on those switchblade shanks. We've got a lot of vertical tools out there, and uh, I think that's something that guys can use to add more versatility to a tool that already has a lot of versatility built into it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you take a tool like that with shanks, there's not much that it can't do. And, you know, in today's world, we're looking at going to less tillage tools but ones you know we're we're replacing three tillage tools with one right we, you know we're looking at owning one or two tillage tools that have got the capability to do what your four prior tools could do yep you know you own a vrt or a 2200 with shanks and a 5200 you've got it sewed up I mean, no yep. more mulch finisher, mm -hmm. you know, no more 875, right. you know. Um, and I know that doesn't fit the mold for everyone, but uh, there's a lot of guys that it does. So mm -hmm. that's what we'll be demoing. <clears throat> We're probably going to do some strip till demos there as well. Um, speaking of strip till, our 60-foot Black Dawn 1 bar is going to ship any day. With units on it already? No, go? they're coming separate. Okay, we're gonna gotcha. have to we have to mount the units because they make the units in Sycamore, Illinois. Okay, and they make the bar here in Milwaukee. Oh, okay, yeah. So that Milwaukee plant is just their tool bar factory. I see. But they, their headquarters is in uh, Sycamore, Illinois. Okay, that's where they make all the units. I see. So they're shipping them in two separate uh, trucks. <clears throat> we're going to install do the install at our shop but, excited about that yeah it, it's going to ship this week mm -hmm. so so yeah. yeah we're we're going to have a 60 foot black dawn one uh 30 inch toolbar with uh, dawn pluralite units with the mole knives on it sweet pretty wicked mm -hmm. pretty pumped about it there's a lot of demand there and i think the 60 foot strip till market is is a big deal <clears throat> you know a lot of guys running bigger planters and it matches up well and they're they're not a low horsepower unit but they're low enough to where you can pull a 60 foot bar without having to hook two tractors to it right together mm -hmm. so definitely manageable but yeah <clears throat> that's kind of what what we've got going on right now um you know, we do talk a lot about hunting in this podcast. We do. Mm -hmm. But I don't have much for hunting. We don't. Um, we shot our bows yesterday for, or not yesterday, Sunday for the first time since. Yeah. Yeah. Archery season, of course, is, is creeping up. Um, we've been coyote hunting a couple times unsuccessfully, you know, with the crops being up. That makes it a lot tougher. But we do have a couple spotted <clears throat> there on my farm, actually, where we had the field day. Mm-hmm. We've got a pair spotted that we're really starting to hone in on. and uh, I'm honestly trying to think of the last one we killed. Oh, it was in the, it was at Ackley's, that one that came out from the right and came out like this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's been mm -hmm. a while ago. Yep. He had beans because we went over there and his beans were real mm -hmm. tall. Mm -hmm. So it was like, <sighs> trying to think if our bean, beans were planted. Uh, I don't think so. Yeah, it was like May. Mm -hmm. May was probably the last one, but it, it's hard with crops growing right now. But mm -hmm. pretty soon we'll we'll get back into coyote hunting. We've been yeah. I've done a little bit of fishing, nothing crazy. We haven't went up to Lake Erie yet this year, or St. Clair, or anything. So caught some. <clears throat> I've caught some bass. I want to go catch some smallmouth and some rivers. So if anyone out there is listening and you know of a good river, like the White River or the Salamone or... Uh, the Miami? The Great Miami in Troy, Ohio. If you've ever fished that for smallmouth, reach out to me. I want to do that so bad. Um, I love catching smallmouth. I think they're, they're beautiful fish, and they fight like crazy. They're super fun to catch. Um, so... Yeah, that's what we've been doing. Been uh, getting a lot of stuff ready. You know, mm -hmm. our we're, we've got we've got all of our staff moved down to the new store there on Twenty Nine, mm -hmm. where we're continually continually evolving that location, making it more efficient. Um, really excited for where that thing's at today. 
um, the shop is just super efficient and uh we're making the parts warehouse that way as well it's a Um, never ending full circle right oh yeah if you're not evolving not becoming more efficient you're you're going backwards Mm -hmm. oh uh the sign's up the sign yeah and i've posted that a few times on our uh newsletter the sign our new we got a brand new sign huge sign Mm -hmm. this thing's like 20 feet tall it's lit up it's got vendor signs on it it looks great Mm -hmm. looks really good yeah and uh definitely a big change from what was at the farm that's for sure oh yeah and i i had people driving by wabash in the past and they'd be like yeah i drove by there but i didn't know what it was Mm -hmm. you know there wasn't a sign whereas now you can't miss it yeah i drove by i went out there the other night Mm -hmm. i was like holy cow like it was the first time i had seen it lit up have you ever seen it lit up no oh it it's, it's lit up uh, i mean i seen the picture that you posted on the email blast and it's like oh it's lit up like a christmas tree when i say you can see it from a mile away that that's no exaggeration <laughs> looks good but good deal yeah so we got uh <clears throat> one of our service trucks was kind of down and out the old red rocket ambulance it had a a carrier bearing out in it cody and i and another tech we went on a service run this spring with it and we were driving and it would just keep making this loud knocking noise which if you were familiar with driving the red rocket that's really not out of the ordinary (laughs) to hear a loud knocking noise it's an old chevy kodiak uh chassis don't knock on her too hard well i mean i love that thing it is loaded to the gills with tools and and i mean you could show up to anything and you'll be able to fix it Mm -hmm. but it it's it's seen better days well i mean yeah it's been younger before Mm -hmm. i guess but uh anyway we finally thought we better get that fixed so we did we took it up to a semi-repair shop and Mm -hmm. heck in no time they had it fixed so dad was hoping that there was some major issues with it he was just dead set that we were going to have to sell it because mm-hmm. it won't cost too much to, to fix it oh yeah oh no i wouldn't will let that happen no so no i'm yep. pretty sure i it went was... and picked it up the other day and drove it up there and heck it was done it, it was, was done, done like the next two days day. yeah yeah two days yeah they went and picked it up today mm-hmm. so it's back in action so you'll see the red rocket out there tearing up the roads again and uh so that's good news the gang's all back together so (laughs) but that's all i've got for now i think cody yeah i can't think of much anything else other than uh i mean on our entire drive up here i mean there was crops all look pretty good yeah i mean you know granted we didn't cover the whole country coming up here but when we snuck through northern indiana northern illinois and mm -hmm. into southern wisconsin i didn't see anything to to cuss about yeah yeah for sure dark green Mm -hmm. tall consistent those are some pretty good words for early august yeah so for sure keep getting some moisture and it'll be a fun harvest Mm -hmm. but uh we appreciate everyone listening to the podcast if you want to tune in and get deeper into fennec equipment send us an email call the office uh with your email address if you give us your email address i promise in return you will get some great content you'll get our email blast every friday that contains several new our our newest youtube videos that cody and i are doing Mm -hmm. we talk about what's going on in the shop i think it's really good we give our if we get a new trade the the very first opportunity to look at that new trade piece is through that email blast we save them until that email blast so you get the very first chance to look at some of our new trades good stuff so if you if you listen and we don't have your email get it to us somehow call in the office um send send a pigeon something and we will get you some some more content so that's all i've got for today want to head home tomorrow get back at it and thanks for tuning in yep thanks guys appreciate it